I'll start by saying I'm Tom Gardner, co-founder and CEO of The Motley Pool, and how proud I am to be part of the Concussion Legacy Foundation as a board director since 2017, and uh, how thankful I am for their data-driven approach to a very important subject, one that has impacted the lives of a number of people that I know and probably hasn't had an impact on my life, having played high school football and one season of college rugby. And, um, and so I'm really excited to be able to talk again with Malcolm Gladwell about this topic, the author of so many books. Which book would you like me to celebrate that you think is most relevant to the concussion legacy uh, work? To the Malcolm. concussion legacy work? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I don't know. I suppose it's probably David and Goliath, since um, this has been a fight against a Goliath in large part, right? Uh, a series of very large institutions and practices that have long. Um, so yeah, if you want to, that, that was all about the art of battling giants. So this is much in keeping with the spirit of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. I'd like to rewind the clock to your first connection with this subject because you've been writing about it for a long time and the interaction you had with Dr. Cantu and Dr. Anne McKee and Chris Nowinski uh, and that was at a time when they had 16 brains in the brain bank, and now they have more than a thousand. So can you uh, um, share how you began to engage with the subject, why, and, and a little bit about those early conversations you had with them? Yeah, well, I was just interested. I mean, <clears throat> I had a very weird way in, which was I got interested in the Michael Vick case, totally unconnected. But as often, is, you know, is the case you start in one you start with one thing and then it leads you. I just, I was fascinated with the notion of our relationship to, first of all, the idea that we would all have been appalled by the way that Michael Vick treated his dogs, but not at all appalled at the way the game of football treated Michael Vick. So that sort of got me going. And I, um, and I started with just with the general notion that it's a very brutal game. And I got, that was the beginnings of this kind of growing concern over concussions. And so I just ended up talking to all of these people who are now kind of pillars of the concussion fight, but at the time were, you know, like Anne McKee and, um, and Chris Nowitzki were, were kind of off in the wilderness trying to, trying to raise awareness. So this was years ago. This was, God knows how many years ago this was, 10? at least. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were a lot of, I guess, understandable, maybe if we think of David versus Goliath um, scenarios, there were a lot of denials about uh, the risks and what the data, the early data was showing. And I don't know if there are any examples that come to mind for you where, um, how these things tip in the mm -hmm. favor of denial to consideration, reconsideration, uh, and, and that could, I'd be curious, maybe even on the different perspectives, what you think the NFL's reaction and how that pattern plays out, what the reaction of a parent uh, and mm -hmm. how that might play out, um, a school, a headmaster, a football coach. So what, what's the journey that maybe yeah. there's an overlay of those patterns from denial to reconsideration to some changes in behavior? Well, I think it moves from the bottom up. Um, I'm more and more convinced that these things trickle up, they don't trickle down. Um, by which I mean that I think it's going to start with the parents of adolescents who are playing sports and getting concussions and their, cons you know, that kind of grassroots concerns. Those are the ones I think that are ultimately the most powerful. Um, uh, the NFL will only, only begins to listen to these concussion arguments when they're aware that you know, the moms and dads of kids playing Pop Warner are suddenly really concerned about concussions. That's where it starts. It didn't, it was never going to come from the commissioner's office. You know, he, he, the commissioner and all the owners are far too vested in the status quo. But a parent who's 11 year old just has, just has had his second concussion. That's somebody who, you know, that's a very different kind of reaction and a more powerful one. I gave a speech, I talked about this actually in a podcast I did for my, for revisionist history. I gave a speech at Penn in, to the student body 
couple thousand students as part of one of their lecture series. And it was right after the captain of the Penn football team had committed suicide and totally out of the blue. And then they had done a autopsy and discovered his, that he had CTE. And I, at the time there was a, I was, I, my speech was all about to these kids, to the students of Penn saying, why didn't this suicide matter to you? Why did you just kind of shrug it off? Because they did kind of shrug it off. They continued to go to football games. Nobody, there was never any sense that the school or the game was in any way responsible for what had happened. And um, I don't think it would be a very different matter today. I mean, this was again, six, seven years ago. Um, I do think, but that's another kind of grassrootsy thing. I think if students at a school, you know, when they say, oh, that, that guy was in my math class and he seemed totally normal one day. And then he out of the blue commits suicide and maybe it has something to do with his playing football. That's a, again, a very different kind of much more motivated response to this issue than you would get if it were just setting policy at the top level. Mm. Can you talk about that burden of proof uh, episode and um, uh, in, in the revisionist history podcast and in particular about Frederick Hoffman and maybe yeah. some, some analogy or comparison you might see to Chris Nowinski. Yeah, so Hoffman is, I talked, a lot of that speech I gave to the Penn undergrad was about a guy, a remarkable guy named Frederick Hoffman, who was basically a hundred years ago. And he was an inspector, an analyst for one of the big insurance companies in America. And he was the one who began sounding the alarm about black lung disease because his company was insuring uh, miners and was noticing a lot, a large number of coal miners were coming down with this inexplicable illness. It was killing them in extraordinary numbers. His company was on the hook. And he was, he was the one who stood up and said, you know, I think this is, this has to do with, with uh, coal dust and how it's affecting the lungs of these miners. And we need to do something about this because people are dying. And what, what is striking about that was how long it took the world to come around to Frederick Hoffman's position. He was, a, again, a lonely voice in the wilderness, but not for five years or 10 years. But it basically, he began sounding the alarm at the, around the turn of the century. It wasn't until the 60s, really 60s and 70s, that progress happened. And it was this very sobering reminder of how long these kind of solitary voices have to keep um, sound in the alarm before people will listen to them. You know, there you had a very similar situation. You had an entrenched industry and a series of other institutions, among them, by the way, the unions who were not helpful in this instance. You had the owners of the coal mines, the customers of the coal mines, and the unions of the coal mines, each of which had their own reasons for looking the other way. And it took two generations to bring them around. And, um, you know, but Hopefully we know more now about how to speed up that process. And Hoffman didn't have a lot of, didn't have something like your foundation um, helping him out. He was, he was just really a lone guy who had the, incidentally, he also sounded the alarm about cigarette smoking in the same period, which is, he's an extraordinary figure. But you know, these prophets can spend a lot of time wandering around the desert before the world listens to them. Uh, why not? see if you have a methodology or could create one in real time. You're one of the most flexible thinkers I've ever encountered, Malcolm, so I don't mind putting you on the spot. What would you design as a methodology to speed the process toward enlightenment on a subject like concussions? Again, it started at the bottom. Um, I think I've, I've actually been ast astonished at how quickly uh, awareness about concussions has increased in recent years. Um, it's been a lot faster than I thought it would be. But I think that, I do think the key is about parents. You know, it's funny, I had a conversation. I was doing this event for, it's like a charity event. And I was interviewing a guy who was a uh, champion, Olympic champion figure skater. And halfway through, he was talking about practicing and how hard it was. And so I said to him, well, wait a second, how many concussions have you had? He was just a guy who's like in his late 20s, early 30s. He'd been skating since he was a adolescent, young adolescent. And he said, oh, 
I think I'm getting this right. He said, I've only, he said, I've had 12, but only three required hospitalization. And then he kept on talking. And I was like, wait a minute. And I realized, you know, there's no in that, you know, in football, we're now aware of concussions and we talk about it all the time. Do the parents of kids who are engaged in competitive figure skating talk about concussions in the same way? Because I said, well, wait a second, why so many concussions? And then it was really obvious that you're practicing these, you're practicing over and over again for hours a day, every day, these incredibly complex jumps. And when you fall, you hit your head on the ice and you're not wearing a helmet, right? There's nothing to cushion the blow. So this guy had 14 concussions, three that involved. It's like he was, that's worse than a lot of football players. So it's like, you know, the, you know we, we focus a lot on wrestling and football and rugby. And we forget, you know, that's just the beginning. Um, that this, you know, these, this, this problem has, takes all kinds of curious forms. And, but like, so, I, so I, I guess I would start to answer your question. I would like to start at the bottom and I would like to broaden the conversation. I think we don't help our case if we make this all about football. Um, this is about health, the health of young people. And wherever we see the health of young people compromised, we should act. And I think our case would be easier with football if football didn't think they were being singled out. So I would, it's about, it's about early and broad, I think is, is the answer. What do you think is the likelihood that these sports will get redesigned? I think high. I mean, because here's a case where, you know, the data, the, the analytics revolution that is hitting all professional sports and not just professional elite sports um, is creating a generation of people, of fans, coaches, and players, all of whom are really comfortable with directing their activity um, according to the data. So this is just not true a generation ago. But now, if you talk to a 15-year-old tennis player at, you know, a sports academy, um, they will talk, you know, endlessly about all the data that is collected on their serve and their backhand and their, you know, or playing soccer today is teaching someone how to play soccer, analyzing the performance of a soccer team is indistinguishable, I mean, sorry, is, 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 is unrecognizable compared to a generation ago. So a whole generation now is just used to thinking about sports through the lens of data. And I think it's a very easy jump now to use the, that same analytical approach to analyze risk reduction. It's already happening with Non, you know, with non-concussion, we have changed the training protocols in virtually every sport over the last 10 years um, in light of what we have learned about injury, injury prevention. You know, can we, you know, knees. There's a whole different approach to strengthening, to protecting con uh, the knees of people engaged in contact sports than there was five years ago or 10 years ago. So I don't think it's hard to make an, an extension to the brain and say we need to have the same kind of considered analytic approach. Um, we've been, so in, in other words, the, the crusade that you're involved in and this foundation is involved in is being aided, I think, dramatically by a parallel crusade that's about improving performance. Uh, Malcolm, I was wondering if you see any examples in society today where data is being used on behalf of preventing health risk. Yeah, uh, well, this is a weird example, but it's a historical example, but if you, I was reading recently about um, uh, drunk driving. And what's fascinating is that over the course of the last, let's say, uh, almost a hundred years, our notion of what an acceptable threshold for alcohol has, uh, for, uh, for how much alcohol you can have in your system and still drive safely, has been steadily dropping. It used to be, I think, if, I'm, if memory serves, more than two times higher. So if, if most states are now 0 0.08 is the blood volume that's acceptable, it used to be like, you know, 0.2 or 0.16 or, and what's happened over time is that our understanding of the uh, vulnerability of human 
uh, decision making to the presence of alcohol has just improved. And also our, our, our willingness to take risks um, in when it comes to human life behind the wheel has changed. And so those two things, better data about what exactly it is that alcohol does and a societal change, a change in our willingness to tolerate risk in a given uh, field has led to a dramatically different landscape um, uh, today than we would have had 50 or 60 years ago. You, you know, if you go back 50 years, if you hit somebody and you were drunk, you, chances are you walked, it was an accident. I mean, it was very hard to convict people of drunk and driving. Totally different story today. So you see that's, to, to my mind, is a very similar kind of parallel because, and the crucial thing there is that a change in data in our analytical understanding of a problem has to go hand in glove with a change in society's relationship to that problem. So it does not help if the, you know, if the doctors come back and say, we have a better understanding of susceptibility to alcohol, if society doesn't say, and we care about that, right? Those things have to go hand in hand. Uh, let's play a hypothetical out and imagine that you have accepted a Zoom call from four people that will be asking for your advice on what to do. And those four people are a parent of a child playing competitive contact sports at the high school level with the coach or coaches of those sports, with the athletic director of that school and the principal headmistress or headmaster of that school. Those four people are on the line and mm -hmm. they're asking you for your suggestions on what steps they should take or what actions they should take. Uh, well, here's a fun one. Um, anyone who plays starting today or starting, you might have to forward, fast forward, take your contact sports, any sport where there's a, where you think there is a reasonable risk of concussion, football, rugby, you know, adds, I don't know whether lacrosse belongs or not, but add whatever nice hockey. hockey, whatever ones you want, and say that any kid who has played a contact version of that sport prior to their freshman year in high school is not eligible to play that sport in high school. Let's start with that. So two things, we are protecting those from further injury who have been exposed to a dangerous environment before getting there, but also we're just changing the, 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 the um, all of a sudden you make it really, really hard for anyone who's serious about sports to play the contact version before, before mid-adolescence, which is a huge step forward, as you know, the data says. We would like to prolong it even later than that, but let's just change it. Let's just change the, the conversation. And just say you played peewee tackle, peewee football, you can't play in high school. I'm sorry, not at this high school, right? Um, Secondly, I'd like to have a long discussion about practice, what practice looks like. Um, if you've got it, you know, I mentioned figure skating before, let's get the figure skating people in there and say, wait a minute, should you guys be wearing uh, protective helmets, protective helmets in practice, um, you know, across the, and football, do we need, what is the minimum amount of contact we can have in practice? Um, and then I'd like to, with the principal, and the AD, I'd like to, to get them talking about weight um, in contact sports. Because I don't think you can, you know, force equals mass times acceleration. I mean, you cannot get away from that fundamental equation. And being hit, you know, where there are massive weight discrepancies, particularly, which is particularly true in high school sports, um, you have a bigger problem. And, you know, we have to think seriously about, is there an upper and a lower limit on who can play football, um, a, uh, or at least as, you know, a, do I need to know the, the weight distribution of the players I'm playing against? Um, and to make sure the teams at least have some reasonable match in the weight distribution. I mean, I think we can start to, and there's where data can help us. I mean, I'm just saying that, but I would love someone to come back with the data and tell me how much of an issue are these large weight differentials in contact sports? And if, they, if that's where some significant portion of concussions are coming from, um, or even subconcussive impact, then I would, I think that's something, I, a route I would follow. I mean, this is uh, uh, not a great question, or, uh, but why do you think high schools or parents or 
what is happening culturally that some schools might not want to have that phone call with you? Well, I mean, it depends, you know, there's very, very different. There are le legitimately places in this country where uh, parents of kids regard sports as the, their child's ticket to a university education. And so they get very, very nervous. Uh, I think legitimately when people talk about closing down um, sports opportunities, I think in, in that case, that fear has to be met um, honestly and sensitively. And we have to make it plain that we are trying to save these sports and not, um, not outlaw them. We're not trying to end football. We're trying to save football. And we have to be, if that is our goal, we got to be plain about it. I mean, I have talked sometimes about ending college football. I'm not, I shouldn't be in this conversation. I, you know, I think, I think we have to be, if we want to get buy-in from parents, we have to say we're trying to save, save the game. Because I think it's unrealistic to think we're going to do away with football. Um, so that would be, that's one set of, of, of concerns. And then there are other you know, at the college level, there's a whole set of concerns that has to do with the income that comes from big time college sports. Now, that's only a handful of schools, but it's a huge, you know, hard to have that conversation at Oklahoma um, or Alabama. And again, there you have to address the, um, uh, the enormous economic um, role that those sports play in um, those communities and at those institutions. And that, you know, that probably requires a conversation with the state legislature. Uh, final few questions. Um, do you think football contact, tackle football, should be banned for children under the age of 14? Should that be, oh, or absolutely. could that ever? I mean, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's no excuse um, for playing full contact uh, football for kids that young. But on the general theme of saving the sport, not banning the sport, um, if we ended contact for kids under the age of 14 and at the same time put in a um, highly uh, 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 considered, uh, carefully planned out training regimen that taught kids how to tackle, that caught, caught, taught kids how to play the game more safely, that. If, though, if that went hand in hand with a contact ban prior to 14, I think, we, I think you'd get better buy-in because it would demonstrate a commitment to saving the sport. What a wonderful thought. I've never, I've, I was, I'm such a big advocate of flag football under 14. The Concussion Legacy Foundation is the point you're making is right in line with that. I mean, I watch a lot of NFL. When you watch a really well-coached, well-prepared player do, a, do, a, do the right kind of tackle, it's a joy to behold. Right, I mean, uh, and you you can see, oh, that's that's how you can do it and minimize your risk. Um, there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way way here, and I think this is an opportunity to teach the right way. What about any comparisons you'd be willing to make between concussions and COVID nineteen, and how society deals with the in seemingly invisible risk? Well, I mean, we've seen it with COVID nineteen. This is a country that doesn't that that is that is uh, highly divided on these kinds of invisible risks and preventative measures. Um, you know, it makes me think that if, uh, if, we, if, if this was North Korea, oh, sorry, if this was South Korea and, and they played a lot of football and we were trying to get rid of concussions, we could probably do it, probably do it <laughs> months. <laughs> right? it's, it's a, yes, it's amazing their commitment to the data. Obviously, 10 years ago, they had a different perspective mm -hmm. on SARS and they learned yeah. So there's a, there's a certain reality and hope that the data and the experience can help us learn more quickly. Um, uh, I, do, I do like that uh, comparison. This has just been something I've been interested in uh, and concerned about for a long time, ever since I wrote that New Yorker piece years and years ago. Um, I happen to, you know, I, 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 I'm a sports fan as well. And so, you know, I, I take sports very seriously and um, would hate to see us lose a great sport like football just because, you know, uh, we're, we, we don't care. We're, you know, we're not concerned about the safety of the kids. You know, I was listening to my, one of my favorite podcasts, Bill Simmons, the other day. And Simmons 
was talking to Ron Rosillo about the NFL and they were comparing the NFL and the NBA and about how the different approaches each sport took to the COVID problem. And they were joking about the fact that the NFL, like, oh, well, the NFL doesn't care about its players. It's like a, it's like a punchline for them. You know, and that's sad, you know, when sports fans openly joke about the callousness of the NBA owners and NBA, I'm sorry, of NFL owners and NFL leadership and make such a stark comparison between the NBA's approach and the NFL's approach, that's problematic for football. Um, and that's sort of why I think this is such an important initiative. Like, uh, you know, the, we got a football is lagging and needs to be, needs to join the 21st century.